Well, good morning. It's good to gather in the Lord's house with his people on the first day of the week. The uh, announcements are in the bulletin. Uh, if you would please take those with you uh, when uh, we conclude and we'll uh, dismiss through that door there. Um, that way those who want to go straight to their cars are able to do that and those who uh, want to, to linger and chat uh, in, the, in the parking lot are also able uh, to do that without too much dancing. Um, but just to highlight a couple of announcements, we will have our Young Adult Fellowship uh, on Friday uh, at 6 p.m. and that will be uh, here at the, at, at the church. Uh, we'll be watching uh, the movie in spirit and truth and then discussing it. And it was planned to be a make your own pizza uh, thing, but I think what we'll do is, is we'll just order pizza. That way, um, if anyone gets sick, we can blame Papa John's. Um, we also will have the Young Adult uh, Service and Adventure Week, uh, and that'll be June 8th uh, through uh, the 13th. And you should, uh, you should let uh, uh, Joe Wilson know if you're interested in that. He will be um, uh, coordinating those, uh, those activities. Also, we will not have an offering uh, this uh, Lord's Day as part of the service, but if you would like to uh, make a contribution, you can do so either online um, at uh, the website in the bulletin, or um, you can mail a check uh, to the church office if you would like to. Well, let's uh, take a moment and put aside the concerns of the day. Um, let's stand as we uh, are called into God's presence with Psalm 113. Praise the Lord, O servants of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting. The name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above the nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? Let's stand and sing to God's praise, hymn number 457, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. pray. Father, we thank you that you have gathered your people from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. You've called those who belong to you to yourself. And you have seated us, making us alive with Christ, seating us with him together in the heavenly places. And so we pray that you would receive the praise and the thanks, the worship and the adoration that we offer you uh, this morning that you would delight to nourish our souls, 
that you would delight to make you our souls great delight, showing yourself as the great God who saves. And we pray, our Father, that your Son would be exalted in our hearts and his Spirit would dwell in our midst through Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll remain standing as we confess our faith using the words of number 76. Christian, what is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace wrought in the heart of a sinner by the Spirit and Word of God, whereby out of the sight and sense not only of the danger, but also of the filthiness and odiousness of his sins, and upon the apprehension of God's mercy in Christ, to such that are penitent. He so grieves for and hates his sin, that he turns from them all to God, purposing and endeavoring to constantly walk with him in all ways of new obedience. Amen. Well, let's remain standing as we confess our sin together using the prayer printed in uh, the bulletin. Let's pray together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who pardons all such as we repent and turn to you, we humbly confess our sins and implore your mercy. We confess your sinners, deviants, and unrighteous people. We have rejected your holy will and holy calling in our lives, and instead have desired that which does not or promote your own life. We have not loved you with pure heart fervently, nor have we loved our neighbors ourselves. We have not done justly, nor mercy, nor walked humbly with you, our God. Please do not treat us as we deserve, or as we have treated others. Instead, have mercy upon us, O Lord, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out our iniquity. Restore unto us the joy of your salvation. And sustain us with your free spirit, and we may rest in your grace. Strive for holiness, and live in the light of your grace now and forevermore. Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated and hear these words from Romans chapter 4, which assure us of God's pardon of those who look to him for mercy and grace. Romans chapter 4, Jesus Christ was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And so having been forgiven much, we know that all of ourselves belong uh, to our God. And so we return a portion of that which he gives to us back to the worship and work of his church. Hear these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, may become rich. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, whom have we in heaven but you, and where else shall we go but to your Son, for he alone has the words of eternal life. You are eternal and unchangeable. You have existed before time began. You know all things. There are no surprises to you. And you have ordained all things to come to pass, and that they do so in such a way that the greater glory of your name is manifested and the good of your people is advanced in everything that happens. And so, Father, we pray with confidence for the persecuted church and that tiny island nation of the Maldives, particularly this week. Would you free that small nation from the tyranny of Islam? 
Would you bring many there to worship the true and living God, free from the condemnation and power of sin, and rest in your goodness and your grace? Strengthen those precious few who belong to you in that land, that they may persevere to the end. And encourage them, we pray, not only with your faithfulness to them personally, but as you grow and strengthen your church and sustain her from all enemies. Our Father, we thank you for the share we have in the ministry of David and Johann Stoddard in Berlin. Would you equip David as he leads mission to the world, enable him to hold accountable his, fellow, uh, his fellows on the leadership team there? Would you give clear and strong gospel witness through MTW in Berlin and, of course, throughout uh, Germany? That, that that land again and be filled with those who are called by your name. Would you redeem many to yourself? Father, we pray for Rock Creek Fellowship, asking that you would give wisdom and blessing to their pastor, Eric Youngblood. Please grant their session understanding and prudence as they make plans for reopening and to bless the communities in which they serve the faithful proclamation of the gospel and the love of your people. Father, we thank you for Luke's faithful service here, and we pray that you would return him home safely after his deployment. Please protect him from temptation, strengthen him in his love for holiness, shield him from both malicious attacks and the dangers of bureaucratic incompetence during his time on active duty. We pray you would bring an end to war through Christ's return and reign on the earth. Lord, we, especially after the events of this week, are confronted with the brokenness of the world in which we live. The callous disregard of human life and brutality. Father, we pray that as, as we speak and say and respond to the events of this week and every week, that we would do so seasoned with grace, pointing folks to your justice above all and enable us as citizens of this land and yet at the same time subjects of the kingdom of heaven to strive and to love justice and mercy father we pray this week for evelyn Botello. would you bring blessing to her grow her in spiritual wisdom and knowledge of christ grant her full assurance of your great love for her Preserve her from every temptation as you call her to holiness. Give her wisdom as she and her roommate uh, seek a new place to live. Help them to glorify you in their search. Our Father, we pray for Fred Pierce and his family as they care for his son's family and comfort them in their grief, as well as prepare for his sister's move back to assisted living. We praise you for enabling that move to happen. Would you continue to provide for her and, uh, and Fred's whole family? through these trials. Father, we thank you for the successful surgery of Linda Hogue. Relieve her discomfort, we pray, her pain. Grant Diana new ways to minister to her and strengthen them by the assurance of your saving power. We ask your blessing on the Hera family as they go to visit his father. Thank you that they're able to do so. Please preserve them in their health in the intervening days. And let them have a joyful visit, pointing and remembering and rejoicing because of the salvation that is in Christ alone. Father, we pray you would enable us to be a comfort to Monroe Davis in his loneliness and disability from broken leg. Would you heal him? Would you grant him freedom from sorrow and anxiety as he has laid up? Let him know and enjoy the full riches of Christ. Our Father, we thank you for the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray you would grant wisdom to those who will vote in the coming days. Our Father, preserve us from the leaders we deserve. Continue to sustain those officials whom you have placed in authority, that they may wisely manage this crisis. We pray for its end. Would you grant a treatment to be found for coronavirus? Enable us to resume worship and communion with one another soon. Strengthen our love of the gospel by this season for Christ's sake, and do all things according to your will. Amen.
Let's stand and sing from Psalm 76 as is in the bulletin. Let's stand and sing, God is known among his people. Amen. Please be seated. If you have your Bible, would you take it out and turn with me to Exodus chapter 13. From time to time, we are reminded in Exodus of the main character. The real contest in these events is not between Yahweh is, is between Yahweh and Pharaoh. It is not primarily between Egypt and Israel or Moses and Pharaoh, but between Yahweh, the God of Israel, and Pharaoh. Israel, in fact, here at the sea is not even a combatant, but a bystander and a beneficiary of God's saving work and God's conquest on their behalf. The Exodus serves as a type or as an example of God's salvation and how it works in every age. We see here, as God saves his people, and his people receive the benefits of that salvation because of God's faithfulness to his covenant promises. And this shows us our way of living. We must understand our role as his people and as the church, that we are not culture warriors. We are those who have received everything as a gracious grant and gift of God. And that should transform the way we treat our neighbors. Here, the drama escalates. We have persevered through several sections of interchanging detail regarding various ritual observances and aids to memory of Israel's exodus from slavery in Egypt. And we come now to the record of the first few days out of Egypt. There's been a great reversal. Pharaoh freed Israel, but now, again, Pharaoh changed. And he executes a back his slaves and send them to the brick pits again. And so we have here in Exodus 13 and 14 the final showdown of a great epic. The drama is intense here. It's like the final scene of a movie in which the two main characters, the protagonist and the antagonist, the hero and the anti-hero, fight it out in a, a winner-take-all contest. And so notice as we go forward how it becomes clear that it is a battle between Yahweh and Pharaoh. Israel fades into insignificance, as does, for that matter, the whole world. It is just the Lord of the covenant fighting for his people and Pharaoh coming to destroy 
God's church. And so I want to say four things uh, with you here, and it's, it's all about God here. Uh, God's care, verses 17 to 19. God's presence, verses 20 to 22. God's trap, verses 1 to 9 in chapter 14. And then God's in verses 10 through 14. Well, before we read God's word, let's pray, asking for his help and blessing. Father in heaven, would you give strength to your church through uh, the reading and hearing and preaching of your word? Would you enable us to delight in it, to love it, to be strengthened by it and convicted by it, all to the glory and praise of your name? Hear us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Exodus chapter 13, beginning at verse 17. Pharaoh let the people go. God did not lead them by the way of the land of the although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. He took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Sukkot and encamped at Etam on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pihiroth, between Migdol and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the people of Israel, They are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts. And all the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, What is this that we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, king of Egypt. And he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. And the Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped at the sea by pi Heroth in front of baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not. Stand firm. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. And you have only to be silent. Amen. Thus far in God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Here God lures his enemies to a crushing defeat. So that his people know their safety is within his care. And he brings even the wrath and anger of the ungodly to result in the praise of his glorious grace. Let's look in the first place in verses 17 through 19, God's care. The route that they take is given here. But one of the things that we see clearly is that God knows his people better than we know ourselves. God knows his people both individually and collectively more thoroughly than we know ourselves. We consider that that last Lord's Day, that our Redeemer knows every one of its sins in its full depth and its full depravity and has satisfied God's justice for every part of our sin's condemnation. 
And that reminds us, or at least it should remind us, of the silliness of trying to hide our sin from God. Or trying to make ourselves appear better before God than we really are. Sometimes we try to hide how bad we are, don't we? I was at the dentist this, this weekend, and a couple of times they, they asked me, well, how long has it been since you had a, had a cleaning? And I didn't want to tell them exactly how long, because I was afraid they'd use it as an opportunity to charge me more. You know, when it's been 12 years, it's... So I, I just said, well, you know, it's, it's been a little while. And maybe that works with dentists and hygienists. Maybe not. I don't know. But they didn't charge me more. But, you know, it doesn't work with God. He knows the full extent of our filth and sin and depravity better than we do. A reminder that our Redeemer knows the full extent of our shame and has already forgiven us so we can be confident in his love. And so he knows the full extent of our sin, but he also knows the full weakness of our faith. He will preserve us in the faith and prevent anything from overcoming us that will cause us to lose our faith such that we ultimately fall away. We see God's perfect knowledge of Israel's faith here as his sovereignty extends even to the route that they take out of Egypt. They do not take the well-traveled highway, the Via Maris, the the way of the sea. There was a, a highway from Egypt to Palestine. If Israel had taken that route to the promised land, the journey would have taken two weeks. It was the obvious, predictable, easy, short route for Israel to get where they are going. But instead, God takes them the long way, a way through an expansive desert and across an ocean. The Via Maris, as with most well-traveled routes in the ancient Near East, was also fortified. A chain of Egyptian fortresses and outposts and surely toll booths dotted the highway. Egypt had built a defensive canal from the Mediterranean Sea to a series of marshy lakes on the Sinai Peninsula to further regulate interchange and travel between Asia and Africa. And then beyond the Egyptian frontier, there would be Philistine fortifications. And so instead of the easy, direct route, God leads his people by a southerly route toward the wilderness, the desert, to avoid military action. And he does this because he knows the character of his people. He knows the weakness of their faith. They will turn back at the first sign of trouble vindicated in just a few moments when Pharaoh and his army come to recover the slave. Also, when Israel reaches the promised land in Numbers 13, they would rather go back to Egypt than fight for what God promised to give them. Israel may depart equipped for battle, or perhaps a better translation would be in military formation, but they're not As we'll see, they would rather live as slaves. They would rather live on their knees than die as free men on their feet. They are ready to doubt God's ways at the first hardship. And so God preserves them from some hardships. So we need to see by way of application how God knows the tendency of our hearts to wander and so orders all things to preserve and strengthen his people in the faith. Now, this does not mean that God permits no hardship or trial to come upon his people. Quite the contrary. We'll see soon. But rather, God graciously shields his people from any hardship or temptation that would cause them to ultimately fall away. And allows his people to endure only what is for their ultimate good. And this means he leads them on an indirect path to the promised land. God preserves his chosen ones from anything that will so shake them that they will fall away. God does not always lead his people by the way that is short, successful, and easy. Because often such paths lead to spiritual disaster and expose hearts that never truly grasp the grace of God more than intellectually. So we should beware the easy path. It's not to say we should never take the easy path, but we should beware. When I was a seminary student in Jackson, I worked at a a very large uh, church as an intern. And the man who was the executive minister there was, was fast-tracked uh, to prominence. He was hailed as a, as a young rising star in our denomination. His father was a minister. His, pres- his presbytery exams were praised for both their precision and their thoroughness, if that's possible. He went overnight from being a seminary student to a member of the senior staff at a church 
and he had 70 people reporting to him directly or indirectly. He summarized the great change to me one time as we were discussing a seminary course that was taught by one of the older ministers on the staff there at the church. He said, oh, well, he gave me a B in that worship class, and that's okay. On Tuesday, I was a student, then on Sunday, I was his boss. Along the way, some of the elders at the church expressed concern about putting someone so young into a position of such authority. But their concerns were brushed over and dismissed by those who wanted to see that man in a position of great responsibility and authority. Well, after his meteoric rise, he eventually deserted his wife and three children and ran off with a member of the church staff. And he serves as a beacon, as a warning against speedy success and quick advancement. When God delays success from us, when God brings affliction to us, when God keeps us from quick success, he is often saving us from the losses that come from a life of ease and success. The route Israel takes out of Egypt is just one example of God working this way. I'm sure many of us can think of how God has done this in our own lives, how he has kept us in his grace by keeping us from what we thought in our ignorance was the best way. And that should give us all the more confidence to trust in him. For generations after generations, Israel would look back on this moment here in Exodus 14 and see the salvation of their God. Remember what their God is like and be motivated to trust him more. We should do the same thing. Joseph had great confidence in this God, didn't he? Look at verse 19. As Israel leaves Egypt, they bring the bones of Joseph, embalmed those centuries before. Joseph died in the faith trusting God's promise to bring his people back to the promised land, out of Egypt. And so even in death, his instructions were a testimony to his faith in God's promise. And so we see a way of application, that God's people's hope in the resurrection means that not only do we show respect to the bodies of the dead, but even in our deaths, we point forward to him who is the object of our faith. Let's look at God's presence, verses 20 to 22. We pick up the story with Israel at the final town, the final outpost before the wilderness, Itham. Why do we pronounce it Itham? Well, if we said Etham, you wouldn't suspect that I had a seminary degree. So we've got to say it differently. Right now, there's nothing between Israel and freedom. And God's presence is manifested in fire and cloud, physically manifested before his people pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. Both of these are for the spiritual comfort and the physical comfort of the Old Covenant Church. A measure of shade by day from the cruel, blistering desert sun and warmth from the cold, dark desert nights. And so for their weak faith, the ever-present pillar encourages them to trust his words, to believe that Moses is leading them for their good, to rest in God's good purposes for them. These are physical, miraculous manifestations of God's presence, sometimes called a theophany. And they were with them before Israel constantly, both to aid in the speed of their travel, so that they could travel by day or night, and of course night travel would be much easier in the desert, as well as to give Israel direction for their journey out of Egypt. And they are there, the, the pillar of fire and cloud are always there, never ceasing, never slumbering, but always with and over the dwelling places of God's old covenant church as they wandered. This manifests God's glory. It is identified with his glorious presence dwelling with his people. The pillar of cloud and fire represents the Shekinah glory of God our Father. Shekinah glory is a term that's often used, at least in my opinion, pretentiously. Shekinah is simply a transliteration of the Hebrew word for dwelling or settled. What is this pillar of cloud and fire? It's, it's God's glorious presence, dwelling, leading, protecting the Old Covenant Church. Now some people will make a big deal about that term, Shekinah glory. And of course, if, again, if, if, you, if you use that term Shekinah, you, you, you sound smart, don't you? You sound like you got the knowledge. You got the, you got the secret knowledge, the Shekinah knowledge. 
But remember, Shekinah is just the English transliteration of a Hebrew word that means dwelling. Don't be wowed because some theologian uses a fancy foreign phrase. Because I think that distracts us from what is truly worthy of our awe. What is this here? What should cause us to marvel here? God's glory dwelling in the midst of his people, his sinful people, graciously revealing to them himself, meeting them where they are, graciously identifying with them. These are my people. This is, this is an outward display of some measure of God's true inward glory. But it is also a display of God gloriously, graciously being with his people, just as he promised, and declaring to all the world, these are my people, as he's constantly with them. And so we should see, by way of application, the marvelous grace, the patience, and love of God displayed for his people to see. These people who are so weak in faith, who doubt every word Moses speaks, who are ready to turn back at the first sign of trouble, yet God is pleased to call them mine and to dwell in the midst of them. And yet God makes a way for these people to be his, to know his blessings, to enjoy his presence. He extends his special care and guidance to these undeserving, unfaithful people. And so the marvel of the Shekinah glory, the glory of God dwelling with Israel, is how God speaks voluminously here about the nature and character of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as good news for sinners. In the gospel, in the gospel, God in Christ made his dwelling in the midst of sinful mankind to show us the glory of the Father, full of grace and truth. Christ came to give his people grace upon grace, for sinful, undeserving people, to call sinners to repentance and faith. And so he poured out his spirit to lead his people into all truth. So I think we see here the importance and the beauty of the church, don't we? God is especially known, especially present with his people as they gather to praise him, to reflect on his salvation, to bring their prayers and desires to him for help. I think, I hope, One of the things that this pandemic has taught us is how much we need the church. And it's one thing to watch a a theological pastoral address on a screen at home. But it's wholly different to, to gather with the people of God in worship at his house. To confess our sin together, to confess our faith together, to be assured of God's pardon together. There's a special blessing that God gives for that. We should pray that God will enable us to resume gathering for worship morning and evening without the threat of this virus. So God has once again provided his people with everything they need, hasn't he? They're on the edge of the wilderness, about to leave in territory forever, bound for the promised land. They're carrying Joseph's bones with them, reminding that they are witnessing the fulfillment of a promise given centuries before, that people had believed for centuries, and it is now coming to fulfillment. They have the sign of God's glorious presence in their midst, assuring them of God's faithful love and protection. Everything they need for spiritual success and faithfulness is there because of what God has provided for them. Your children you should pay attention. Remember, all, has God, all God has given Israel How well God has equipped Israel for spiritual success. And see what Israel does in a moment when tested. Let's look at God's trap, verses 1 to 9. They're to turn back, you see, in verses 1 and 2. God has been guiding every step Israel has taken. Even the day of redemption was ordained by God. And now on the verge of freedom, God orders Israel to do something that will display just how worthy he is of their trust. And just how powerless God's enemies are. He orders them to turn away from the wilderness of Sinai and encamp somewhere by the sea. Not really sure where this is. The word migdol means tower. Uh, So it's likely near one of the Egyptian signal towers or forts. Uh, The word uh, Pyahiroth suggests it was near a narrow opening of that defensive canal that Egypt had dug to control who was coming and going between uh, Sinai and Egypt proper. 
So they are, in short, to turn around and travel away from the promised land to camp near one of Egypt's forts with their backs to the sea. Why are they to do this? Well, you see in verses 3 and 4, God is not done with Pharaoh. Some of you may have seen the 1957 classic, The Enemy Below, with Robert Mitchum and Kurt Jurgens. If you haven't seen it, I'm going to ruin it for you, but that's your own fault because you haven't seen it. But in the movie, and it's a great movie, uh, there's this Navy destroyer that is hunting a German U-boat. And the destroyer is hit by a a torpedo uh, from the U-boat. And the commander of the destroyer orders his crew, make it look like the ship is crippled and on fire and completely helpless. And so by appearing helpless, he lures the U-boat in for the kill, but instead is able to decisively cripple and defeat the enemy submarine. Well, God is doing something similar here. Pharaoh has realized that the release of Israel spells economic disaster. And so God commands Israel to turn back because he has one more defeat in store for Pharaoh so that there will be no doubt who is worthy of all the glory and praise and adoration. The word used for wandering in the land here is also used to describe cattle who have escaped aimlessly. It's used in the herds of cattle are perplexed. There's no pasture for them. And so Israel is made to wander like cattle not knowing where to go. And so Pharaoh will receive news that Israel is lost, endlessly wandering, and you can tell how giddy he is, can't you? God's design, though, is to entice Pharaoh to attack so that God can destroy one more emblem of Pharaoh's power. He destroyed the economy of Egypt, the livestock and the crops. He destroyed the firstborn, the future of Egypt. Now he will destroy the army, the glory of and symbol of Egyptian power. God plans to glorify himself over his enemies so that they will know his name. God knows the hatred of Pharaoh's heart, and he will cause the hatred of Pharaoh's heart to result in the praise of God's glorious grace. Upon hearing of Israel's seeming misfortune, Pharaoh will set out to destroy them. But his hatred will be his undoing and humiliation. And his hatred will serve to the praise and glory of God. And so you see in verses 5 to 9, Pharaoh does exactly as God said he would. He repents of his repentance. And his heart is changed again. It had been softened by the grief of his firstborn son. But now it is hardened afresh. And so he decries his decree of emancipation, having realized Egypt cannot afford to be without its labor force. He realizes the cost of his obedience is too much, and so he turns back from his repentance. This is a reminder of the importance of the grace of repentance, that it is a gift of God, isn't it? Many may turn away from sin for a season or a moment when the cost is great, or the pain and shame is too great to bear because of that sin, but many quickly return to sinful patterns because there was no True repentance, only momentary regret. And so we need to see by way of application and remember what true repentance is. As we confessed earlier, it's not only a spiritual work, not only a saving grace worked, done by God to show him or her the disgusting depravity of his or her sin. But it also enables a person to see and behold the greatness of God's grace. To grasp the mercy of God to those who see it. And that brings grief and hatred for sin and a turning to God with new intentions of and delight for obedience. But Pharaoh grasped neither the sinful. Yet true repentance is something for which Christians should pray and after which we should seek. Seek lasting repentance, not momentary regret. Because only where there is lasting repentance is there freedom from shame. We must understand what true repentance is and be able to distinguish true repentance in ourselves from mere remorse or regret. Well, Pharaoh's regret is over. And so his army, his 600 elite chariots and the other chariots and the infantry and the horsemen and so forth. And 
Israel had gone out defiantly in verse 8, or rather by God's mighty power. But now Pharaoh displays his own defiance, his mighty power, as he proposes to exact vengeance on rebellious Israel. And so verses 10 to 14, God's faithfulness, God's faithfulness. Look at verse 10, there's a cry out to God. Understandably, Israel is horrified at the sight. A cloud of dust appears on the horizon, and then it becomes apparent. The most powerful army, the army of darkness and bondage, is racing toward them. And they're trapped. Behind them is the desert territory that would be ideal for the mobile tactics of Egyptian chariots. Pharaoh looms large in the approach. The whole army centers on one man. Pharaoh drew near. In front of them is the sea, trapping them, leaving them no escape depriving them of all earthly hope of salvation. And they cry out because Pharaoh draws near, and they have no escape. And they call out to Yahweh. Earlier, they had uh, cried out to God generically, chapter 2, verse 3, and they had cried out to Pharaoh for relief in chapter 5, verse 15. But here, they cry out to the covenant Lord. But is this a cry of faith? Or merely a cry of distress. And I, think it's, I think it's the latter. Uh, some months ago, uh, my son uh, tried to use our new uh, television as a touchscreen. And uh, you can't use a television as a touchscreen. He doesn't know that because he's two. But there was a cry for Wells, and it was not a prayer to Wells. I think something similar is going on here. It is a cry of anger and frustration that God has done this to them. And they cry out to Moses too, don't they? Verse 11, they ridicule Moses. They're rather ironic in what they say. Egypt is a land known for its graves. At least they haven't lost their sense of humor, I suppose. A macabre sense of humor to be sure. But their cry to Moses betrays their faith, their despair of themselves and their despair also of God. But God had given Israel everything she needed for spiritual success. They witnessed his power in Egypt to defeat Pharaoh, his glorious presence right there with them, the bone of Joseph showing God was faithful to his promise. They had plundered the Egyptians. They went out from the land wealthy for all their advantages. All they had seen and experienced of God's power and faithfulness They doubt again. They refuse to trust his good purposes for them. And in fact, they abandon all hope. Spiritual success is not possible if it depends on them. If these people are to reach the promised land, God himself must save them. God himself must carry them. And as the prophets will write, on eagles' wings. Now they repent of their salvation, don't they? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt, they say. This is a common device of Satan against God's people to cause us to doubt God's saving work, to discourage us by all the forces arrayed against us, the hostility of the world and the shame of our sin Satan confronts us with. His aim is either to restore us to bondage and, failing that, to make us miserable in our freedom such that we long to go back into bondage. Well, Israel survival Legalism is They come up with a survival plan. Satan's tactics are working. They denounce Moses for the salvation he worked and the redemption God made of his people. And they say, we told you we would rather serve Egypt than die trying for freedom. It's the battle cry of cowards everywhere, isn't it? It's better to live on your knees than die standing up. They have no confidence in God's power to save them. How forgetful they are of God's power. See their weak faith. See how right God was not to take them on the speedy route. But Israel, she's on her way, condemning herself by her words, speaking and talking... Who's who's been in Israel's shoes? But to condemn yourself, but then you're interrupted. And that's exactly what God does here through Moses. Moses interrupts them before they can say anything else that is foolish. 
before they, can, before they can condemn themselves further. God saves them. He interrupts them. And that interruption is a great mercy. What does Moses say? He says, fear not. Stand firm. And be silent. Probably should have led with that. Moses tells Israel there is no danger. God has placed his people exactly where he wants them. God will deliver his people. There's an important truth illustrated here. God will never place you in a situation that he cannot handle. But remember the, the common proverb, God will never give you more than you can handle. There's printed on pillows and all sorts of kitsch. You don't have to study the Bible very long, or in fact live very long, to, to realize though that God's providence frequently places his people in circumstances that they cannot handle. Right? That they are simply not equipped to overcome in themselves. And that's exactly the point, isn't it? His people are powerless to save themselves. He has placed Israel in a position that maximizes their weakness, that maximizes their helplessness, and magnifies his power to save, that exalts his glory in salvation. And here is why they are wandering so that he can teach them, that first generation, this is just how great I am. Before you criticize, well, you know, if God were really such a big God, he wouldn't need to contrive a situation like this just to glorify his name. Well, you've missed the point if you push back here. You forget what Moses has said. Israel, this first generation of Israel, they are so dense that they still do not get, that they contribute nothing to their salvation. That God must do everything for them to ensure their survival. Israel must learn this very simple lesson. There is no situation so hopeless. There is no sin so grievous. There is no person so lost that God cannot save or that God cannot handle. And so Moses tells Israel in no uncertain terms, stand Watch and be silent. God is going to save you. Watch your God save you. Watch your God destroy your enemies and show you his glory and power. They contribute nothing, again, as always. God goes to combat against Pharaoh in this final showdown. How often are we like Israel here? We think our situation is hopeless because we look to ourselves for victory rather than seek the salvation God alone accomplishes and gives by grace. I saw a graphic on the internet just this week and it read, God will never give you more than you can handle. He just sometimes has more faith in us than we do ourselves. But is that biblical? Is that what we see here? Is this simply a test of Israel's faith in themselves? No. Not at all. This is Israel failing the test of faith, making plans to head back to Egypt, and God steps in and says, Stand down. I will save you again. And these people who are so scary to you, you will never see them again because they're going to drown. Here again is the gospel display. This is why worship in word and sacrament is so important. Because we forget the simplicity of the gospel. Sometimes we get caught up in the theology of it, but the sacraments remind us of the simplicity of the gospel. In baptism, you're you're entirely passive, aren't you? Someone sprinkles clean water on you or pours clean water on you, illustrating and confirming God's promise of total cleansing from sin. You don't come to baptism and say to the minister, "Well, well, why don't I help you carry the water? Or, you know what, you're you're kind of short. Why don't I help you lift it up over my head? No, that's not how baptism works. You simply receive the water. Just as in the gospel, you simply receive God's cleansing. Likewise, at the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, Christ's body and blood, broken and poured out for sinners, are illustrated in the bread and the wine as the promise of the gospel is confirmed. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. You don't come to the Lord's table with anything. It's not a BYOB event where you you bring your own bread and booze from home. Rather, the elders give the bread and the wine to the people of God to proclaim Christ's death until he comes. 
Interestingly, the focus is on his death. Why? Well, the Lord's table is so that Christians remember the risen, reigning, returning Savior, but also that we remember now Christ died. Christ died that you may live. So that we remember the Lord's table is not your reward because you've been a good little saint this week. And you are worthy to partake in his body and blood. No, the Lord's table is only for those who desperately need a dead, bloody Passover lamb. So that God's wrath, so that God's judgment for your sin will pass over you. Will not come near you. Because all of your sin has been laid on him. So in the Lord's table we receive bread and wine, life, strength, nourishment, sustenance. Because of his sacrifice for us. And yet we're so slow to understand this, aren't we? So God shows us here. It has always been this way for my people. It's not what they do for me that saves. See how God fights for his people. This is what Christ came to do. To dwell among his people. And to fight for his people. To free us from the dominion of sin and death. By laying down his own life. In the place of all the lives of his holy ones. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your beloved Son who loved us, who gave himself for us, who was crucified for our trespasses and raised up for our vindication. Oh, we pray, our Father, that you would give us joy as we rest in him. Because we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and respond uh, to God's word by singing, Glorious things of thee are spoken. Let's stand and sing together.
receive now God's blessing upon his people. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now, until he calls or comes, and then forevermore. Amen. Well, please be seated. We'll dismiss by uh, Rose, starting with the front. Y'all want to...